Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm actually doing pretty well. Really? What happened? Uh, I don't know. I, um, uh, I'm on a rigorous program of diet and exercise. How about huh. that? Uh, I'm not, but, but that's the best answer I can give. Oh, I'm sorry to hear you. Uh, Bush is going to sign the fence bill. Oh, and, yeah, the fence bill is kind of a, a little hobby horse of yours. And Sika, well, you're the one that got me on it, Bob. I, would, I didn't care about the fence until you convinced me that it was the most <laughs> benign liberal solution to America's immigration no, problems. No, actually, I, I, I'm ambivalent about a fence. I mean, I, I, the idea of a whole fence, like, you know, from sea to shining sea, uh, I, I don't like the symbolism of. But I do think securing the border is important, and uh, I guess my argument was that, what was my argument? It had to do with that being a prerequisite for, for domestic, uh, tighter domestic enforcement of uh, something or other. Well, it was, and it was, a way that to, it was a way to secure the border without uh, disrupting uh, the immigrants who have been here for 12 years, and it lets them live in peace. Right, right. That was, that your, was it. That was that was it. That was your argument. That was the liberal part. Yeah. But anyway, your 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 blog suggests that you're rather more obsessed with this than I am, which is okay. We got you. You know, it's um a small pond in which one we all got to make a splash somewhere. I, I and then, no, not you. You you uh you write about the history of of the universe, and then, and your next book's going to be about something bigger. So, God. Yeah. So um. You're not known for biting off those small ponds. No, I'm not. Okay. I make little little splashes in big ponds, and you do like the reverse. Well, I don't think I've had a big splash, but I um. Well, technically, the reverse would be a big pond and a little splash I, anyway. I successfully sowed the seeds of paranoia and doubt in the blogosphere. You're working on it. Well, Mickey, I'm feeling tired yet festive. Uh, uh, why festive? I don't want to hear about the tired. Uh, because uh, we think, if all goes well, the this dialogue will be accompanied by the redesigned home page, for starters, and the comments section. Um, certainly, it, at some point in the next 24 hours, those things should show up, probably when this dialogue actually debuts. And but if, if you don't see them, you should check back. And what's new in the redesigned home page? Well, the redesigned home page allows us to display more content and more different kinds of content. Uh, because I mean, we, we can bill it in a variety of ways. Um, and it, 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 for various reasons, it... it, it permits us to actually run more content, should that be in the cards, um, and, and just gives people, I think, a, like a broader, more appetizing menu to choose from when they show up at the site. People can judge for themselves. Um, we're still, we're sticking with the current color scheme for now, I think, unless I change my mind in the next few hours, but um, we welcome comments on that. We've never invited comment on, on these greens before. I was kind of afraid of what would happen if we did. The green, people can people can comment. The greens are so ugly that we're branded with them now. I think. Well, I I, I do. They're part of our legacy in in a way that makes me hate to give Although them up. People said that about Tucker Carlson and his bow tie. He'd never give it up, and then he gave it up. Well, that was a smart move on his part. So maybe we should think <laughs> about it. The the. Uh, but it, 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 does this mean there are going to be more dialogues? Well, I don't want to make any rash predictions. But, but the plan is that, I mean, lately we've been kind of vacillating between two and three a week. Certainly we should make three a week for the next few weeks at, at a minimum our goal and then try to move up from there and see what happens. The design makes it easier to, to schedule a number, of, uh, a number of dialogues, and we'll see. Why not millions of them? <clears throat> Why not indeed, Mickey? Thanks for Perhaps. sharing that thought. Perhaps because uh, it would threaten the, the control of certain chief blogging heads. Well, no, it's, there has to be a certain consistency of product if people are going to want to keep coming to this site. There has to be something coherent about the site. It's not ideologically homogeneous. No, I guess that's I was just teasing you. But, but there, does, there does have to be some form of, of selectivity. But, but the homogeneity leads to the next thing that's new, which is the comment section, which should be right below us. That would be down there. Uh, there should be a tab next to the Afterthoughts tab uh, that allows you to click Comments, select Comments instead of Afterthoughts. You click that tab and you see either that nobody's posted a comment or that somebody has. Um, and the deal is uh, to post a comment 
on this dialog or on whatever dialog you're watching, you click add comment. Um, but then in addition to that, there's an area kind of within the comment forum, apparently, for more freeform stuff that's not about any particular dialogue. I don't know. I, this is what I'm told by mastermind Greg Dingle. Um, you mean you can talk about, like, the reemergence of Bow Wow Wow or something? That's a, is, if that's a cultural illusion, it, it, it shows that you're younger at heart than I am. Incredibly topical cultural illusion. Yeah, well, I've been busy with his redesign, man. Okay. Um, so, uh, anyway, I worry, as I said, about the comment section, because this is not an ideologically homogeneous blog, and so spats could break out. So I encourage everyone to play nice. Is, um, is, if you don't. Is the comment section going to be policed? We will send people to the principal's office. Because, you know, the European Union is, is going to crack down on video uh, newscasts that uh, on the grounds of policing hate speech. So... Hmm. If we have any particularly hateful commenters, we, you might not be able to go to Paris anymore. That's true. Well, we also will enforce our hate speech code, which is that all hate speech must be directed toward AIM culture. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, but no, I guess there will be a form of policing. Uh, we, we will be able to delete stuff and, 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 like, ban people, which makes them go use a different email address, go to the trouble of that or something. And people reg have to register to, to indicate a certain minimal level of, of seriousness about the enterprise, which probably takes about, you know, 45 seconds. I, I think, think they should be subjected to intrusive inspection regimes. We also do retina scans. Okay. Um, so that's that. And then there are a few other little fiddles, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a big day. Do you feel the vibe? It's I big. It, 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 yeah, no, they're, they're, the, the, the room is crackling with anticipation. Yeah. We're pushing our year anniversary, I think. Uh, November 1st. The wife just looked that up and, and reminded me. God, I, I, it, it's made such a change in my life, Bob. <laughs> Give me a minute and I'll think of it. Oh, come on. Uh, you can barely leave the house without without being besieged by throngs no, of well-wishers, as I, I said. I, I don't leave the house, so... Um, well, that's... Yeah, that's I, haven't call. Put that, I haven't put that to the test. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, it's a big, big day. Big. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, I, I, I hope everybody joins in the celebration. Um, and, and, and we thank Greg and, and Brian, who, who have labored uh, mightily. Yeah. I mean, I mean... On the redesign. And I think, I think the phrase dingolink is catching on. You think so? I saw it reference one other place. That reminds me. We should, you should link to that. If I that, find, if I can find it, are named yeah. after Greg Dingle, of course. The because um, I want to start like a Dingle Inc. of the wink uh, of the week, not Dingle Inc. of the wink, Dingle Inc. of the week thing that we can talk about some other time. Yeah. You should. Um, okay, so uh, should we actually talk about something other yeah. than our site? Yeah. What do you think, North Korea? Uh, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, got this email that's not ostensibly about North Korea from Ralph M. It says. Considering that your viewership is generally made up of political junkies, etc., how about a blogging head, uh, well, analysis of the Sunday political talk shows, meet the press, face the nation, etc. Um, now, Mickey, first of all, if you have, want to have any cosmic observations about the various Sunday shows you want to make, you could, but if not, I would proceed to a North Korea point. Proceed. The point is that uh, John Bolton was interviewed on both Tim Russert's Meet the Press and on George Stephanopoulos. And I thought Stephanopoulos kind of probably characteristically did a better job. Um, I mean, here's my take on Tim Russert. He very much likes to play kind of the tough interviewer, but the way he does it is he has this bullet point list of tough, no-nonsense, confrontational questions. But he's so intent on getting from one bullet point to the next, he never asks the tough follow-up questions, right? His interviews are not fundamentally interactive. So he doesn't. He doesn't press people. He never traps people. He always moves on to the next bullet point. Absolutely. Ahead of time. And and That's he had his, John yes. Bolton in his sights and failed to pull the trigger for that very reason. Bolton says that that that, that the purpose of these uh, the sanctions that were just passed by the Security Council are to deprive North Korea of the ability to continue its nuclear weapons and other programs of of weapons of mass destruction. Total nonsense. I mean they. D d uh, the ability to continue. I mean, they can do you know six, eight bombs right now by by consensus of, of Western analysts. I think without getting 
you know, anything without importing anything. So even if these sanctions against, uh, you know, weapons materials, basically, were airtight, that would not do what he says. And then, and then later he says uh, that, that this, uh, the, 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 U, the U.N. sanctions are going to put enormous pressure on the North Korean regime. Again, Russia does not challenge him. That is complete nonsense. I mean, this is going to put zero pressure on the North Korean regime. Um, but that's not a case where you could ever really trap it. What, Bolton's going to break down and say, yes, these sanctions are a facade? No, Tim Russell could have said, wait a second. All this is about is like tanks and fighter planes and heavy weapon systems and spare parts for those things. So even if the sanctions worked completely, the, the core of the, of the North Korea military capability, which is its ability to inflict uh, you know, a tremendous damage on South Korea in the event that we attack North Korea is going to stay intact for years and years and years. I mean, a, a, a good part of that is just ballistic missiles. They don't need spare parts very often since you never use them, you know. It's not like they wear out after 100,000 miles. So, um, you know, gradually, five, eight years down the road, could a spare parts, you, you know, uh, a ban really change the balance of power there? Probably, but but the other thing is that the spare parts are exactly the things that are going to leak through via the black market. I mean, so it, it's just, you know, I, I never thought I would say that the Bush administration is making too much use of the UN, but they started doing it. And this is an example where they want to say they've done something, and so they say we this was a fifteen nothing vote on this this resolution. It really has very little effect. Well, yeah, um, reading reading about what's been written about the North Korea crisis, it seems to me that there's sort of three basic solutions. There's first there's the Chinese the favorite Chinese solutions. Let's let's call these solutions integration, implosion, and invasion. How about that? You're calling them that? Three eyes, yes. Excellent. The, the first China, the first solution is the Chinese solution, which is integration, which is we cut some sort of deal with the Koreans which allow them to stay in power. We promise we won't invade. Uh, they give up their weapons and and the whole situation becomes stabilized. Uh, the problem with that, as, as, as John O'Sullivan writes in, in an article, is that th they're not really going to give up their nuclear weapons. They're going to we're going to have to pay and pay and pay, and you know it's going to come up again. And there's going to be no way out of the cycle. To which I would say, uh, so what? So we pay and pay and pay. Eventually, isn't it true that the North Korean regime will collapse just because the forces of modernity and capitalism will destroy it? Uh, maybe that's a good solution. Um, O'Sullivan's solution, which is hinted at by Ann Applebaum, but O'Sullivan's article is actually more detailed, is to somehow get the Chinese to cause the implosion of the North Korean regime, which everybody seems convinced the Chinese could do with either a couple of phone calls or a cutoff of North Korea's food and energy and trade. Uh, why would they want to do that? Right. Um, O'Sullivan has some argument that, well, we can use the, the refugee crisis in China's uh, turning back of refugees to hold over their head. Uh, we can threaten a trade war, which would sort of bring down both our houses, but it would scare them so much that that maybe they would agree to do this. And it seems to me that's one other thing he has. You mean threaten a trade war with China to get China, with, with to, China to get China to to cut off North Korea? Yeah. Um, it seems to me there's one other thing we could throw in the mix, which which is you know China is worried worried that if the Koreas are reunified that They'll be reunified with U.S. troops there, and that will be a threat. We can say we'll get our troops out. So we can do a sort of take the missiles from Turkey move and you know, offer a carrot to China as well as threatening a trade war. And maybe it just seems to me that, that maybe that's not a crazy way to go. Uh, the crazy way to go is the, is the Bill Crystal, Crystal route. He's still sort of making noises about how there should be a military solution. Obviously, the administration thought that the invasion of Iraq was going to have such a powerful demonstration effect on these yeah. rogue regimes because we're going to do it with, like, you know, ha one hand tied behind their back and only 150,000 troops, yeah. that it would terrify them. No, it and, did have a it, powerful effect. As I said last week, it convinced North Korea never to let UN inspectors in. But anyway, sorry. Well, but also, it, 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 it hasn't had an intimidating effect. Just the opposite. It's pretty clear that we don't have the capacity to, to <laughs> have a war with North Korea at the moment. Um, so... Uh, so I would say that's off the table, and, and, the, and the debate is between uh, options one and two. Uh, option two, obviously, you know, you want to do uh, as quickly as possible before before North Korea gets too many nuclear weapons. 
Well, you, you do, I guess, yeah. I, I, I mean, the, the, at the same time, the, the appeal of it is it's faster. I mean, integration as a moderating thing can take a while, right? Um, whereas implosion, well, you know... And, it, and it'll never... Yeah, it'll take decades, but it'll... Well, we don't know, but but it, it's a long-term solution. The, the There was a... Uh, I mean, relevant to this to this taxonomy is this post in uh, on Liberal Oasis by Bill Sher, where he said the fundamental problem is that the Bush administration wants regime change and China really does not want regime change. Now, if that's true, uh, it's not totally clear why it would be true. I mean, part of it is the idea that China actually likes having this proxy state, which which it might not have with another regime. Um, but if, if that's true, then they really are kind of at, at loggerheads. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I think China does have the power to, certainly if South Korea were going on, to induce an implosion probably of a fairly graceful sort. If they just cut off all food and energy, I mean, the, 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 the nightmare scenario there is that you have to actually wait for everybody to starve to death. But, well. but, but 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 probably uh, people more, see, see, more plausible is that China s sends the word. You know they have high level contacts that look. Should should your dear leader happen to die and be replaced by somebody more reasonable, right. that person would probably have a long and happy and powerful life. That's what people seem to think would happen. But. Well, that, that that's that I think is something that it would be smart for us to settle for. But probably the only way to get China to do it is for that successor to Kim Jong Il to be somebody who is a client of China. Right. More well, or less. well, that's fine. And, and my my answer is that we could. It would also help if we made some promise that we would, would reduce our military presence uh, in, in South Korea, or whatever, or whatever threatening presence we have somewhere on China's border, uh, to make it more palatable for them. Yeah. Uh, it, it, how 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 does China stop the Koreans from Koreas from reuniting though? I mean, clearly the South wants to reunite, right? Well, the the the, the, the attraction of implosion to them is that maybe they could they could uh, forestall that day. I mean, it's not really clear to me why that should bother them. It, it, if it, if it is not uh, some kind of crass extension of American power, and you're you're positing a scenario where it wouldn't be. I mean, you know, China. The truth is, China gets the whole integration picture. They're doing a pretty good job on the global scene of you know fostering their own prosperity, which means playing nice with, 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 with all the kind of relevant actors, even though they're doing this one thing that scares us, which is cutting energy deals with all the, these dictatorships. But still, in terms of, it, you know, they haven't made a lot of obvious missteps in terms of pursuing what they see as their economic self-interest. And it, it's not clear to me that an integrated Korea is not wholly compatible with their with their economic interests. It may, I mean, there may be some problem with uh, all the Korean war vets in China who fought and lost many of their buddies uh, to prevent an integrated Korea. Uh, you would think that that's, a, I mean, how old are those guys at this point, you know? Well, but they're not that old, actually. Just old enough to be in the Chinese leadership, probably. You may be right. And that's the Michael Dukakis generation here, right? Uh... I guess you're right. My father was in uh, South Korea for a while. Well, there you go. There you go. Um, but uh, anyway, that's so. Th those are the only thoughts I have. But I recommend this uh, O'Sullivan piece, and he says he's going to follow up, uh, which he needs to do because he hasn't really put a lot of flush on the bones of his plan. Okay. Um, speaking of speaking of plans that don't have flush on their bones. Ooh. How about the Baker plan for Iraq? Ooh, uh, that okay. was good. That was gr I thought it was pretty good. That was really... I thought it was a gruesome... Were you reading that? You didn't just think a of gruesome, that. A gruesome segue. Man. Um, but, um, it, it, you, know, you know, Baker went on Stephanopoulos right, at, right after we debated whether he was going to propose a partition, actually right before, he went on Stephanopoulos and pissed all over the idea of partition on the grounds that it would be impossible to draw the lines in the cities. But then what is the Baker plan? He wants some plan in, in between cut and run and stay the course. Well, then, it, then the New York Sun revealed that there were two options the Baker group was concerning for Iraq. One is called Stability First, which involves some somehow democracy is compromised and there's a grand uh, sort of lawyer-jerga-like uh, 
Conference of National Reconciliation, and so and democracy is sacrificed for stability. And uh, I forget what the other one was called, but the other one is, is a less favored solution. Uh, and uh, but it's not clear exactly how is democracy going to be sacrificed for stability. I mean, what are well, I what think are, the feeling is that at this point, unless you focus single-mindedly on democracy, it's probably not going to happen, and and uh, and they're and they're going to focus on other things. But what, I mean, but I mean, Dennis Ross wrote this op-ed piece in the Washington Post, where um, you know where he said, "Well, we're going to sacrifice democracy, and then we're going to you know." Uh, bring in Syria and Iran and Saudi Arabia, and they're going to sort of broker some sort of deal. And then we're going to deal with the Maliki government. Well, the Maliki government is a d democratic elected government. So if, you, if, you, if the Maliki government still exists, uh, that's the, then, you, then, you've, then you haven't sacrificed democracy. But that's, that's the Ross's plan. That's not, not the Baker plan, right? Well, right. But, but, and Ross isn't on the Baker commission, but... But it, 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 it's the it's it's the only one I've seen that even yeah, attempts but the, to but flush the Maliki it out. government is in like desperate trouble. I mean, just today it was reported that they fired the top two police officials in the country. So so rife with you know uh, bloodletting militias ha had the police forces been that they had to do that in a desperate attempt to reform them. Well, it's um, about time, isn't it? Well, yeah, but but it, it's a pretty drastic action, and meanwhile they are you know they, they're. Uh, you know, everybody considers uh, Maqtada al sadr's militia a huge problem, but the government can't really deal with it because it's, it's politically dependent on the al sadr contingent in parliament. Meanwhile, al sadr is apparently losing control of some factions of his militia, and they're just going and wreaking havoc on their own. Uh, so kind well, of like all signs to... are that, that things are getting... Uh, quite bad. I mean, here, here's Tom Friedman, who you remember was a champion of the war. This is today, Tom Friedman. Alas, it is increasingly hard to see how our presence is making things better. Iraq, under our nose, is breaking apart into so many little pieces that no political solution seems to be in the offing, because no Iraqi leader can deliver his faction anymore, and there does not seem to be an Iraqi center capable of coming together. I mean, this is almost a more dire scenario than civil war. I mean, there is something worse than civil war. It's all-out chaos, you know. In a, in a classic civil war, there are at least large large swaths of kind of order and harmony on each side of the battle lines. But in some ways, the disintegration uh, points to, to uh, chaos of a more fine-grained... But, but I, don't, I, I, um, I don't quite see what, what happens... Uh, you know, wh how are we supposed to avoid this chaos? Uh, yeah, how, how, does Maliki just quit? Do, is there a DM like? I know, but what I'm saying, is you're there saying a DM like coup? Is do we do we have this national conference and and Syrian troops march in and control half the country? I mean, I I, I just it's not clear to me how it works. No, nothing's clear to me. I mean, it, uh, astute viewers may have noticed that about six or eight weeks ago, I quit playing, paying close attention to Iraq, and I started becoming less and less well-informed about what was going on. And it's because I concluded it was entering one of these phases where kind of all bets are off, and, it, and presumably at some moment in the future, clarity will come as far as what the various scenarios are. But right now, it just seems to me like a black box. It just seems to me like the order is collapsing, and, 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 and I have no idea. I can't figure out what is likely to happen. The, you know, the, 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 that New York Sun scoop that you mentioned, I was actually at first puzzled because the option that it says that, that uh, of the four options the Baker report or the Baker committee has supposedly outlined, and two of which it's paying special attention to, and then the one of those that it's apparently is the front runner, this stability first thing you described, it said the, the way it would work is the military should focus on stabilizing Baghdad while the American embassy, sh embassy should work toward political accommodation with insurgents. And I thought, that sounds like what they're probably doing now. And it was actually the L.A. Times story that added what you mentioned as part of the Ross piece, which is that according to this, this plan in the Baker uh, uh, committee, you would work with Syria and Iran. And that is... Uh, no, that, that, was be, the, that was in the Sun thing, too. Not in that same paragraph. The paragraph right. just said the goal of nurturing a democracy in Iraq is dropped. Period, and it moved on. And I don't yeah. think it did. It did not identify that as part of the stability. According push. to the prestigious blog House Files, it did. But uh, I beg to differ. Okay. But I, I mean, it certainly buried that part of it and separated. Well, I misspelled. It. I misspelled Iran with a Q, so it came out of Iraq. That was a problem. That happens. I'll fix that. It's easy to get them mixed up. Um, <laughs>
But what I was going to say was, uh, this, and you know, first of all, that is different from what Bush is doing. It's the classic realist approach of saying, look, we deal with all the players and don't pass a lot of value judgments on them, if they can be helpful. And B, it's part of the answer to your question about democracy. Why does democracy have to be sacrificed? Well, Syria and Iran may have their own views about how exactly how democratic they really want things to get in Iraq. And, and that, may, that may be something that is kind of, you know, not, not very conspicuously sacrificed, but, but, but kind of well, does well, get but swept under the rug. Well, but everybody's hiding that ball. That's the gist of the plan. What's what is? New, what's new about the plan, as you say, a lot of it is what we're doing already. What's new about the plan is we bring in the neighbors and somehow impose some sort of undemocratic regime that is to their liking. Absolutely. Uh, no, that's right. So, and, and that's why until I came across that segment of it, I didn't get what, yeah. what was so and interesting it, about it. And this. that might be the best solution at this juncture, but, uh, but people, you know, people are, are sort of are, are dancing around that point, even in the... Even in the in the Sun, which you know presumably wanted to paint James Baker as as a horrible anti-democratic realist, um, the other thing that's happened is the Saudis have uh, come out against partition of Iraq in a pretty strong statement hmm. uh, and said that they favored a united Iraq. Uh, maybe that presages uh, some deeper involvement on their part. Yeah, you would expect them to be part of a grand bargain. I mean, the trouble is we need so many things from Iran and Syria right now. We would like for them to be helpful in Lebanon. Um, and we would like for Iran uh, not to develop a nuclear bomb. But, you know, there's only so many things you can get from people without giving something. And, and, and uh, well, if you get creative, I'm sure there are things you can give. But, but um, uh we should. I, I want to look more into to Flint Leverett's work on this, and, and will someday. You, you sorry, I missed that last. Well, time. it's just it's just a footnote. Never mind. Maybe we'll try to get him on blogging heads. Um, so I don't know. That's exhausted my fund of knowledge on the subject. Um, yeah, same here. Uh, uh, now it should be an easy segue from. Uh, well, the, 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 the one other point is that there's all this talk on the left, and, and also this British general that are. Our presence there is hurting more than helping, and again, you know, we think things are bad now, but they could get much, much worse. It's 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 it's, it's entirely possible that um, if we actually leave, and that was the other option that I, I had I had forgotten, redeploy and contain, right. where we were like it's basically your your old retreat to the Kurdish stronghold solution. Um, you know, instead of hundreds of people a day, tens of thousands of people a day could be killed. So it could get a lot worse. Yeah, I mean, bad as it is, right? And anyway, that's my only other point. Go ahead. Okay, we move from Iraq to Muslims. Yeah. Uh, well, just this question. I, I mean, it, 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 there is the larger question of, of doing and saying things that may offend some Muslim somewhere, which we've talked about before in the context of you know the Pope's remarks. And in fact, there was this New York Times piece saying that the Pope's remarks had somewhat complicated the plight of Christians in Iraq, although when I read the story, I actually thought that part of it had been a little oversold at the top. Um, it, it, it seems like the plight of Christians has actually been pretty grim in Iraq ever since we invaded, and that the, their best years were actually uh, under Saddam Hussein. Um, but uh, the, then there is this separately this story in Britain about uh, Tony Blair and Jack Straw coming out like against kind of veiled women. To, to well, yeah, there's, 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 there's a big case uh, where a teacher's assistant was fired from a school with a Islamic uh, minority, a substantial Islamic minority, for wearing a, a full veil, where just the eyes show. And, uh, and uh, I don't think Straw and Blair said she should be fired, but they said people shouldn't wear the veil. And another, another minister did come out and say she should be fired, but just saying that she shouldn't wear the veil was controversial, and I don't know that I agree with it. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, obviously the larger issue is not that somehow it's essential for society that people be able to see the faces of other people. It's a general worry about the integration of, of the Muslim minority. Uh, but I don't... Although Straw said when he asks women to unveil themselves when they're in meetings with him, 
I think he made it sound like it was all about eye contact, kind of. No, and that, and, and, but I think that's funny. The 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 Italian uh, politician Roman Prati also said uh, that it was a you you know you can't cover your face. You must be seen. This is common sense. I think it is important for our society. Well, that can't be the concern. The concern can't be that. Well, especially when I mean, if things are anything like they are in America, everyone who owns a car has now arranged to be almost impossible <laughs> to be seen while they're driving. Okay, seeing someone in the back seat is completely hopeless. That privacy glass, it might as well be painted well, over. Well, and, and they're retreating and becoming a sullen minority. That's the problem. You suburbanites no, hey, are Mickey, retreating Mickey, Mickey, Mickey. from society and Mickey. Mickey, I went to tremendous trouble to get something that is theoretically impossible, which is our car without privacy glass in the rear windows, okay? Regular glass in the rear windows. Had to, had to do a special deal with the dealer. So, so, so be it, 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 careful where you cast your aspersions, uh, buddy. I, I'm against privacy glass, and I guess that means I should be against veils for, <laughs> for purposes of consistency. Um, well, but... It, 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 uh, anyway, the, the, you know, in a society where people are communicating more and more over the Internet and anonymously without face-to-face -face contact, it seems bizarre to insist that you have to be able to observe facial tics in order to have a modern society. That, that's not the point. The point yeah. is that it's a badge, it's a badge of, 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 of non-integration. Well, I think there's a little more than yeah. that. I mean, I think it generally, in the eyes of the beholder, the average Brit, they get kind of bad vibes. They sit there and think, you know, what's going on in, that, in the mind of that Muslim I can't see. But this is, to some extent, in the eye of the beholder. In other words, they're more inclined to feel that way since trains started getting bombed. You know, it's, it, in other words, it's not an intrinsic property of these veils that that's the thought that goes through your mind. But in the current political context, it's not surprising. It's, it's a pretty natural reaction, I would say, for British to have. And, and, and it's unfortunate, and it means that they do send negative vibes and and in a way I'm, I'm sure some some women are wearing it uh, as a as a mark of separation I don't kind of deny any of that and and I wouldn't be it may be true that 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 uh, cultural integration would proceed more smoothly and so on if they weren't wearing them and I wouldn't be against the idea of reducing the number of women who wear them but I actually have grave doubts as to whether you know, this Christian prime minister coming out against them is going to have the intended effect as opposed to the opposite effect. I mean, right? Do you, do you, think, do you think that's the way to, to launch this campaign? Do you think that's, that's going to do what Blair wants? No, it would be much better if it was launched by, by Muslim leaders, but I think Straw was sort of saying what he thought. <clears throat> well, he was. I mean, somebody I mean, asked him a question, he gave an honest answer. But, I mean, you know, in 1971, if Richard Nixon had come out and said, you know, I think these Afro hairdos are un-American, well, it would definitely have increased the number of Afro hairdos, you know. And, and uh, I am not – it just I seems mean, to me – I mean, it raises the question whether to some extent Blair is not doing some desperation, last-minute populist pandering. I, I don't know why he would, because apparently his prime ministership is basically just kind of over, right? But it seems right, to me and if I you really Tories, wanted to – go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Well, it just seems if you really wanted to pursue this, this actual goal, you would confer with Muslim leaders and ask them, A, do they agree, you know, like moderate mainstream Muslim leaders, because it's far from being the case that all Muslim women do wear a veil, right? Right. Do you, do you, but you, you've t it seems to me you've taken a sort of a surprisingly wishy-washy position for you. Do, you. do you think this woman should have been fired? I well, no. I say no. Do you? But, but I, don't, I, I think it, it is possible that it would be better on balance if this weren't like a trend among Muslim women, that, that, that you know, if people are looking at it and getting bad vibes, and it, and it is to, to any extent inhibiting communication, could be that it's a bad thing, but, but I just don't see this as a productive approach to changing this situation. And you situation. don't think and I would not, and I, and I would not buy into a legal, you know, legal sanction in, in any event. And you shouldn't, so you're against the French headscarf ban? I am against that, yes. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the other thing is... Um, uh, do, do, it, does this mean that Muslim societies have the right to require Westerners in their societies to uh, cover Western women to cover themselves? Is there some sort of reciprocity, or is it just a one-way? Has uh, that happened anywhere? I don't know, but if, um, if I were if I were in Saudi Arabia, I would certainly take this to heart. No, I think I think that 
is certainly not an extension of anything that I would buy. I mean, I mean, one question would be, though, if, if, if Blair succeeds, does that mean that, that Muslims have the right to demand that their uh, Christian minorities not wear a cross around their neck or something? I, I don't... Yeah, yeah they could say, like you could say that's a mark of separation. You're a minority and you're advertising your minority status. Right. Um, uh, I think we agree on this, shockingly. Well, we don't seem to be disagreeing... No. At least not. I mean, there isn't a level of vehemence that we associate with disagreement, even though I, I'm not sure we do actually agree. How do you think we disagree? Well, you 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 um you didn't buy into the wishy-washy. You 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 don't buy. You don't seem to buy my suggestion that actually maybe the spirit of Blair's concern is is well placed. Do you? It's the spirit of Blair's concern, which is that there's a vicious spiral in which. You, you seem more anti-Blair in this case than I am. I mean, I think, no. I think what he's doing is not productive, but, 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 it, but it, may, it may be that the concern underlying it is not misplaced. No, no, I agree with that completely. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, it won't happen again. You've got to do what you've got to do. Um, so uh, I think so, that exhausts the actual substance. The actual big topics. Here's a little, you want to you take the spot the fallacy in the right-wing blog uh, test? The what? Spot the spot sure. the logical fallacy in the right wing sure. blog item. Sure. Go ahead. Shoot. Do you do you know Brendan Loy? Is, is that a well known? I know Brendan Loy. He's the okay. Irish Trojan blogger. Okay. He uh, he was he he became a international superstar with his uh, prescient run up to Hurricane Katrina. Okay. Let me see if I can just lower his social status a little. Okay. There's an item that was linked to by Instapundit, who apparently considered it very clever. And here's the item from Brendan Lloyd. He had gotten into some argument with, I think, Mick Joan on Daily Coast. He says, this is the first time I've been linked on the front page of Daily Coast. And I must say, the link is producing a surprisingly feeble amount of traffic. Just 23 hits in the 45 minutes since it appeared. That's roughly one hit every two minutes. A link from Instapundit or Michelle Malkin will bring in 10 or 20 times that, sometimes more. I guess the Coast kids would rather stay in their comfortable little world reading their compatriots' characterizations of the opposition's arguments rather than bothering to go to the original source. In other words, they're afraid to venture beyond their cocoon. Right. Where's the logical fallacy there? I, I, don't, I don't quite see one. There, 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 there are links in their links. There's a way to link that sends a lot of hits. If you write not safe for work, it sends millions of hits. Wait a second. It, uh, if you... If you, you know, link while you quote the entire paragraph that you're talking about, it won't send many links. But I have found that judging from the amount of traffic people send you is actually fairly accurate. I remember when I went on pseudo.com TV, and they, 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 they did everything to promote my website. They held up a picture of it. They talked about cows files, cows files, cows files. And I got zero hits. Goose Mickey? eggs. Nothing. Mickey? I realized that pseudo TV was a, was a fraud. Mickey? Bob. I don't want to suggest that you're not in the middle of a fascinating digression. I thought it was a great digression. <clears throat> but could we get back to the logical fallacy? I, I didn't this? see the logical fallacy. Okay, I here's I the thing. It. He's saying that the very uh, light traffic, the, the, the reluctance of Daily Coast users to click on the link of an opposition blog indicates that they're afraid to leave their cocoon and go to the, you know, go and, and cross the ideological bound. And the way he establishes that, that not many of them are doing it is by comparing it with the number of people who click from Instapundit or Michelle Malkin to his blog. Well, those people aren't exactly leaving their cocoon, are they, Mickey? No, but that doesn't mean that they don't set a lot of people. Right, but, Mickey, surely you're with me on this one, right? Well, I, 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 how is he going to, if, he's, if his principle is that people don't click from left blogs to right blogs, how is he going to prove that? I mean, he's not going to prove it either way. He's going to say that there weren't very many people. Uh, no, but he thinks, he's got to compare it to something. He thinks he's proving that the, the people at Coast are more reluctant to leave their cocoon than the bold, brash, right-wing blog readers. And he shows that by comparing, A, the number of people who click from Coast, from a left-wing blog to a right-wing blog, with the number of people who click from a right-wing blog to a right-wing blog. Well, well I, obviously, I, I obviously, didn't. you know, even as these millions were clicking from Instapundit to Brendan Loy, I'm sure millions were clicking from Coase 
to, you know, Juan Cole or I something. Didn't, I didn't take it that he was he was saying that independent readers are bigger free thinkers and are willing to cross the bounds. I just he was just saying that Coe's readers weren't willing to cross the bounds. Maybe he was making a general point about the balkanization of the blogosphere that both the left and right like to stay in their cocoon. We definitely shouldn't belabor this, but he's definitely confining the allegation to the Coast kids. It definitely follows from his having established the meagerness of their tendency to link by, by using this invalid comparison well, no that way just he described. Could know, there's no way he we'll could... Link, we'll link to the item... There's no way he could know about the, whether right-wing bloggers are willing to cross the line because he's a right-wing blogger himself, so his, site counter, his hit counter isn't going to mention... Measure the fact, any right -wing the fact bloggers that the evidence the he needed is elusive does not change the fact that he mistook evidence that doesn't support his case for evidence that does support his case, okay? Well, it certainly supports his case. It doesn't make his case. 23 people isn't very much. Compared to for what? Big, That's the point. From the, the biggest, you know, from the biggest blog what, in the maybe? universe. Compared to what? Well, it's just not a... a compared to... What people are, the hits Mickey, people are used to getting from other people. I mean, if, you're, if you're a blogger, Bob, you would know that 23 isn't a large number. Okay? It, I, to make his point, it needs to not be a large number compared to the number of right-wing blog readers who uh, click on left-wing blogs. No, I understand, but he, Because his said, case is that left-wingers are more chicken and more cocooned that's, than right-wingers. That's his argument. I thought his case was just that left-wingers are chicken and cocoon, and we don't know about right-wingers. Hey, we, will, we will... Was, surely we've spent much more time on this than it deserves. But we will okay. link to it, let okay, people okay. read it, let those who want to write in supporting your view do so, let those who want to greet me with hosannas... Just put Hosanna okay, just, in the subject heading of the just email. Just withdraw from the issue like James Baker when you're losing. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Mickey, this is so open and shut. Okay, good. I can't believe you got into law school, man. Okay. What law school did you go to? Um, it I wasn't forget. Harvard, was it? Um, Mickey? That's a, that's a private You matter. must have known somebody on the board of trustees if you got into Harvard after missing that question, buddy. I actually did, but go ahead. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, man. I, like, I'm tired after that. Do we have to keep going? I think we, we have do. More. Just, for, just for a couple well, more. Well, just to continue on the, on, the, on the Mickey punishment front. Yeah. This guy writes in, uh, this is Stu. Also, Mickey Kaus continually gets nearly everything wrong. Now, granted, he does not follow that up with as much evidence as you would ideally have to sustain that particular allegation. But he does make one point. You said that Pim Fortune was killed by a Muslim extremist, yet the man who shot Fortune was an atheist with no ties to the Islamic religion whatsoever. I only mention this not to blame you, Mickey, but because you said that after watching the Michelle Malkin video that we discussed last time, and I made the point that, that she tends to artfully arrange information well, she, in ways that leaves she, she had, false she, impressions, she and had, that is a good example. She had actually anticipated this argument and, and, and it had a quote from the guy who did kill Pim for town, or however you pronounce his name, uh, saying that he did it on behalf of the Muslims. Oh, it's, now, always, he it's did, always the case. That was probably part of a long <laughs> litany. He also did it on behalf of the minks and the, and the environmentalists and a bunch of other people. But she had anticipated it, and, 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 and I misspoke and said that, you know, and sort of said that that seemed to imply that, that this guy had, in fact, acted. Uh, on the basis Mi of defending the Muslims, when it was only that she had alleged that. But it's not, yeah, like, it's not like she ignored this man's point. Well, just as <clears throat> in the examples I gave last time of her various artful wordings, it is, of course, the case that if you go back to, her, to what she says and read it literally, she's not misstating the facts. And yet, again and again, the information is presented in a way that you will actually not read it literally and will get the wrong impression and will link to the... To, to the little segment in which I documented a couple of instances of that of her doing that in this very context, but, and I rest but, my case. But, except that in a larger sense, she has a bigger point because this guy became a controversial politician by denouncing Muslim culture and the subjugation of women and its intolerance. So the fact that he was then killed by somebody uh, sort of makes the point that uh, if you attack Muslims, you get killed. Uh, in a way, even if the guy who actually killed him was sort of a general all-purpose leftist. Okay. Uh, so, but, but yeah, she's a little slippery and, uh, and artfully tendentious.
I agree with that. That's a nice way to put it. That was very nice. You're welcome. You're a nice man. Uh, James M. makes the point. First of all, uh, it remains the case that no one has sent in an example. Also, where... wait, also, you're the guy that said Dutch instead of Danish, buddy. Am I? But he says you did that, too. But who, who, which, no, which you, one said I, that well, first? I watched, I watched it after that email came in. It was you. And I said it first? Yes. It was a test. So that's a, so you failed the test last time just as you failed the test this time. What do you mean? You were supposed to correct me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah right. I'm um, sorry. Nice that, my, my bad. Um, this guy, James M., uh, first of all, nobody has yet sent in a case in, in response to the Bob Challenge. What's the Bob Challenge again? The Bob Challenge is, before the Iraq War, give me a case. It's commonly alleged that there were such cases where the U.N. weapons inspectors demanded access to a particular site and were never given it. Okay? So, so that either means that there are no cases or we have no viewers. <laughs> yeah, well, or both could be true. Yeah. Um, anyway, th that's transition to James M.'s note that uh, it's worth noting that we had slipped CIA agents into the previous weapons inspection team and this would obviously, you know, uh, make it a dicey proposition to allow the teams into militarily sensitive sites. So to whatever extent there was even transient resistance, which there was at the beginning, um, although ultimately they were admitted to the sites, but at the beginning of the inspection regime, some, some inspectors were left cooling their heels. He's saying that's understandable in light of the fact that the U.S. had infiltrated previous uh, U.N. inspection teams with CIA operatives who were supposed to gather intelligence for the U.S., under the guise of being U.N. inspectors. What? He's right. He, he says he doesn't know when that happened. I remember it was during the Clinton administration. It was right. completely shameful, and I complained at the time. Uh, that's what I remember, too. Yeah. But the onus is on Clinton, not Bush. I know, and it's a All sign right. of my, you know, lack of partisan rancor or something that I conceded that. You're a big, big man, as always. Thank you. Um... What's the comment on the, on the uh, well, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. Uh, you remember the Bob Dylan discussion? You, I, I, I vaguely remember it. You claim that not even he understands what his words mean. Well, exactly. That's just the point I was going to make. I mean, people wrote in saying, look, it's well known that Bob Dylan borrowed stuff. Uh, for example, the, the tune to Blowing in the Wind was lifted from the melody of an old slave spiritual called No More Auction Block. This comes from Alan R. Um, <clears throat> But you're right. My point is just that he does not, he did not ever comprehend his lyrics. Uh, so I guess if I had already made that point to your satisfaction. Not to my satisfaction. That's my now allegation. My point was it's consistent with a lot of data. It's consistent with the fact that he always refused to try to characterize what the point of his lyrics were. It's consistent with the fact that whenever he was asked a question on that PBS special, he failed to deliver a coherent answer. I have two. First, Like a Rolling Stone is a very easily understood song. I, I think that, that was one of my points. Well, the, second is, ballads. the second is it's hard to even write good, incoherent lyrics. In other words, suppose you look at Highway 61 Revisited. The, they're just absurdist, da-da, incoherent lyrics. But they sort of work. They don't repeat themselves. They don't seem too obviously stupid or showy. They're evocative. So it's just... It's, it's, it's not easy to write lyrics if you don't understand. It's even maybe a little harder than writing lyrics you do understand. Well, I think he had a sixth sense for all those things, evocative lyrics and rhythm and so on. I, I grant you that. The, and that, that's the point, though, is that his intelligence operated entirely on the surface. And he was a little like an idiot savant. Although it is interesting that the, the movie, the, the, you know, these movie producers are now using him to, to serve up songs to order for, that fit their movies. And he watches the movie, and he comes up with a song that fits perfectly, that has, you know, th words that fit exactly what the plot is, and he's become a very, you know, competent movie hack. Yeah, well, also, they like to have his name associated with him. I mean, he's, he's, selling, his name. he's selling his name everywhere. He's got this heavily edited, yeah. edited satellite radio show. He's showing up in ads for... Who's he doing ads for? Who isn't he doing ads for? Uh, but the, the, the thing he did for, uh, for that um, Michael Douglas movie... Things Have Changed was, his, was a, one of the best songs he's done in years. It's a great song. Yeah. And it has great, evocative, incoherent lyrics uh, that yet fit the movie. I mean, you can't say that it's... That well, it's, I can, look, I can, it's I can not, see it's last time. It's not just his name. It's not just his name. He does good work.
I conceded last time I have petty reasons for not liking Bob Dylan. And what were they? My wife likes him. Oh. And thinks he's like hot. Likes him with a capital L, you know? Has she seen him lately? I'm trying to drive that point home. <laughs> I'm trying to get a very high-resolution photograph of Bob Dylan today and it's shove it in her face, but... It's like the surface of the moon. <laughs> hey, who are, who are we to talk, buddy? Um... Maybe I'm speaking only for myself there. Uh, okay. W one correction, you know, I, I told you that the moral of the Jerry Springer story of, of his little, uh, brush with the law was never pay a prostitute with a credit card, Mickey. Right. I hope you didn't act on that advice in the meanwhile, because strictly speaking, uh, the moral of the story, as uh, James H., among other readers, points out, is never pay a prostitute with a personal check. That's what Jerry Springer did. He links to this interesting Jerry Springer commercial uh, that, that was a comeback ad from that mishap that, that relaunched his political career. Very young Jer Jerry Springer. Maybe we can link to that. Sure. I think that's the one we gave the award at Harper's. Uh, Nick Levin wrote an article where he said that was the best political ad of the year. But maybe I'm wrong. We will let the viewers decide, as always. If we can actually find that ad, I guess it should be possible. No, it's we're going to link to it. The guy's saying in the link. Oh, okay, cool. I, th I assume it's the same ad. Okay, cool. Um, Aria, who may pronounce his or her name that way, asks, will there ever be a winner announced in the Lawrence Wright Billboard Paragraph Contest? Well, here's the problem. Yes, I do hope to announce a winner, but among my frustrations with The New Yorker, aside from the fact that its articles sometimes like billboard paragraphs, is that you can't find it online, and I've misplaced my physical copy. Do you have a physical copy of the 9-11 edition of New Yorker, Mickey? Uh, somewhere. I thought it was online. Is it? Yeah, I don't have it, and I, I read it. Uh, right, there goes that excuse. Okay, I read we'll the first and the last paragraphs. Okay. Um, we, we, I'm in the habit of announcing contests and then never following through. It's a bad habit. I know, and I usually have to kind of ride herd on you. No, I, I, I don't announce them on blogging ads. I let announce them on my blog. Oh. And then I don't follow through. Oh. Tim in uh asks, how is it possible that neither of you had an opinion on the hubris discussion, that is to say, on the David Corn byron york encounter? I am, astonished, I am astonished that the argument between York and Corn, which was nearly unintelligible because they were so fierce, did not merit any discussion. I kept checking back on the site to hear your take on it, only to find Ariana Huffington's plug. That was no plug, that was an interview. But, uh, Mickey, do you, uh, do you have anything to say about that? No, I, I thought that uh, the Corn uh, york thing was mainly a document that should be put in the Smithsonian as how vicious and sort of in, in, in you know, insidery can a, can a web discussion of a political controversy get. Uh, I actually don't have an opinion about it. I, I, think. I think it was the platonic version, not platonic in the sense of friendly, but platonic in the sense of the, you know, ideal, the apotheosis of reality TV, right? I mean, that was more real than Survivor. That was real. But they couldn't get at each other. No, well, if they, they, you know, we couldn't have put that on TV. Um, that would have been great. That's yeah. the next step. Bashing heads TV. And it was funny how, you know, when pe viewers wrote in, and it was totally kind of ideologically determined. Half of them said Corn would not let York finish his sentences, and half of them said York would not let Corn finish his sentences. It's possible that both things were true. Here's one, uh, an example on one side. Can't you find someone less obnoxious than Corn? Let me finish, let me finish, blah, blah, blah. I still think he'd have a much tougher time BSing if he had to spar with Victoria Tonsing. That is, if he had the guts to accept the offer. Right. That comes from Lucille. I didn't know there was an offer from Victoria Tonsing. I didn't know either. He might have I, the guts. I find them, I, I like them both, so... Uh, you, uh, you are studiously nonpartisan. I... I haven't read I haven't read Hubris yet, so I can't. My tendency is to think that the plane scandal was wildly overblown, and and Joe Wilson is a blowhard self promoter. But, the latter is true. But I, I you know, I, I, I Corn and Isakoff are two people I, I both I respect are both people I respect a lot, and if they've written a book, I, but the book I should is read about it much more I than that. that. That's not probably the most interesting part of the book. It's about the whole run-up to a run. You should start by watching the, the Jim Pinkerton interview with uh, David, which was uh, which was filmed after David uh, calmed down. It was about uh, three years after the Byron York thing. Three um, years? I'm joking. Like, yeah. it took him that long to calm down. It's a joke. Uh, okay, okay. 
Um, say the guy who called me a weenie writes in to say, Bob, I was just kidding. And, and I should say that I was just kidding when I demanded an apology. So we've, we're, we've straightened out the, the weenie thing there. We both know we were just kidding. Um, um, let's see, is there anything else? Well, you know, there is this one actually genuinely kind of heartwarming thing. Maybe I should close on that. Was that Elizabeth Spires? Nice Lincoln for no, policy. No, we should. We should. That was very nice of her to to, to do a little. Uh, she was picking notable uh, internet sites, and we were selected. This was her foreign policy magazine, the must read among uh, foreign policy elites. And that would be the audience that you want to attract, among others. The egghead audience. Yep. And you know, speaking of which, there was a really good dialogue. I thought between Anne Marie Slaughter and Anatole Levin. If you're interested in, in big conceptual issues in foreign policy. Uh, I, I, I dipped into that. I did think it was very good. It was really it really in, clarified some in, things in, part, in my mind about in, the ideological landscape and where I fit in. In part because he's British and therefore is very articulate. That's right. And she was very good. Yeah. No. It was so good, I, good. I think they both have a future in, uh, in, in TV. But was that the good thing you wanted to end on? No, it's this heartwarming email from Thomas P. Okay. Uh, he says he's an unrepentant hawk. He is, if anything, to the right of Mickey, but he writes to me, not to you, Mickey, although he does say some nice things to you. Right. Right. He writes to me. Also, and perhaps more importantly, listening to you, that's me, Matthew, that's Matty Glacius, and others on the program has illuminated a more thoughtful, frankly patriotic emotional stance from which arguments about policy in radical disagreement with my own views can emanate. So I suppose you've restored my faith in the sincerity and patriotism of the left side of the spectrum, which is nice. I'll say it's nice. Isn't that a... Isn't that, a that is hard when we, we've done the hack thing, which is you read some critical emails and then end with a heartwarming supportive email. The, the hack what, thing, though, is to do that and then not note that it's the hack thing to do, Mickey. But that's why we're not hacks. That's, that's how they tell us we're hacks. We know we're hacks. He actually, uh, Thomas goes on to ask some actually good meaty questions that, that we should address someday when we have more time. But today is the festive redesign debut day, we hope, and I have to get back on that case to make sure it's actually true. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, I, you know, there'll be popping champagne corks around here. Around I mean, the world, possibly. I have seen beta versions of this redesign, and it is a large, should, is a large improvement. That reminds me, though. This is a, a beta version that people will see, and uh, different browsers may react differently. Now, we think we've got it straightened out in the, in the basic browsers, but your browser, Mickey, your version of Internet Explorer, turned it into chaos itself. Well, I mean, Internet Explorer, who uses that? I mean, it's... No, no, but, but I mean, we, we've looked at it in four other versions of Internet Explorer, and it's fine. It's just your Internet Explorer. That's why we're, we're proceeding on the assumption that it's going to work for most people. At the same time, we I, I will try to post, like, a picture of what the site is supposed to look like, so that if it doesn't look like that on your site, on your browser, you'll be able to, to know. How will that and work? we will invite people to write us in with their browser I think type. That's, that's a conceptual difficulty. How... If the picture doesn't display right on the browser, then the picture of how it's supposed to look won't display right on the browser either. Now, it would be like a screenshot, like a, like a picture picture, right? Okay. So that if they get the picture at all in their browser, this will not, I'm not, you'll see. Okay. You'll see. Tr trust me. Um, and, and people should, should, should write in and, and if their browser is, is, is like chopping it up weirdly. Does this mean I can do more monovlogs, by the way? We're monovlog ready, man. I, mean, I, I told you that weeks ago. I, I, I was I expecting to, this onslaught of monovlogs. I know. I promised to do them, and then I... I know. You, like, called me. Bob, I, I, I've decided that my, my, my future is in monovlogs. And you know what happened? Well, they were all just sort of, like, rants that were already in my blog, so I didn't, I didn't think I would add much by, by sort of ranting, you know, in video. But I, I will try. You never know. I know. And you can add interesting dimensions. That's true, as long as I don't eat. I've learned that eating doesn't work. It works for some things. Uh, not for vlogging. No, nu <clears throat> nutrition. It's a good way to get nutrition. Eating while vlogging. That's the new, the new video. Um, DWB. E EWB. Okay. Okay. So this is, uh, I hope the redesign actually exists by the time people see this claim that it does. That'll be great. We'll know soon. I'm on Tenderhooks.
Uh, okay, stay there. Okay. See you around. See ya.